You got a Bible today? Hallelujah. Last week, as we had, as you had Pastor Crab here, I had originally, I told people that dad was speaking, but after some of the things he was going through, uh, we called uh, back up and uh, which worked out well because his blood pressure, the way, the way it was dropping. Uh, so uh, thanks be unto God that uh, we get to be here. I'm thankful for all the preachers that we have in this church that's been able to step up at any time. And uh, for all those who have taken time to be over in Muncie to help us with Pastor Brian Drown, we are a blessed people. Brian Drown kept saying, uh, it's just so amazing that a church can send that many people to continue to preach. Last week while Pastor Crabb was here, I was preaching with Ben Bartons in the Funiac Springs, and I guess I took my liberty. I preached over an hour and 10 minutes on a Sunday morning. Come on. And no one got up and walked out. Can you endure it today? It's going to, maybe not today. But, uh, but anyway, I did. I just, I just took my liberty. They start church at 9 o'clock in the morning. Dear goodness. You shouldn't need to be out by 10. You start at 9. And we were still late to the restaurant. Thank God for the long-winded preacher, I guess. The spirit of Raymond Rothwell got on me. And, uh, and I went on. All right. You got a Bible? All right. Acts chapter 20. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. It's 1148. 1148 means that you're preaching late. Acts chapter 20. It's been good. It's all about what we're doing today. Amen. Acts chapter 20. I want to look at this story here. Starting about verse 18. And, uh, and looking at things that's, uh, that, that's happening here. Uh, so look at verse, uh, verse 18. It says, And when they had come to him... He said to them, you know, from the very first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you. Speaking of Paul, he said, from the very first time I came to Asia, how I lived among you. All right. Serving the Lord with all humility. How many knows that's what we need to do? Serve the Lord with all humility. Say serve the Lord. Now, let me just pause here and go on a little uh, story. Uh, I took someone with me to Africa many, many, many years ago, like 1995. That's many years ago. Uh, I took someone with me, and uh, they got up and testified. They done. Been, they went to be with the Lord many years ago now, and uh, they got up and testified and said, uh, "I've been serving the Lord." And uh, they were 68 then, and I think they said, "I've been serving the Lord for over 50 years." And uh, pastors came to me afterwards and said, they've been preaching for 50 years? And I said, no, in America, and we say we've been serving the Lord. They take the concept of once they got born again. But I'm here to just to give you a little bit of a, a public service announcement. Just because you got born again doesn't mean you're serving the Lord. Come on, let me help you out. Uh, I know it sounds good. I've been serving the Lord, you know, whatever. To serve the Lord, that means you are actively involved in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, thank God you're born again. But serving is active. Anytime you go to a restaurant, you don't want a lazy servant or server. You don't want a lazy waiter or waitress, right? You want them to serve. Hey, my cup's empty. Would you give me a refill? Where did they go? They said they're going to bring a refill back 10 minutes ago. Man, I need something to drink. And someone says, well, I'll go find them. And you can't go find them. You drop a fork on the floor. And you're going like this with your empty fork and nobody sees you. But servers and servants or waiter and waitresses that are busy they get tipped really well. Pastor David Shipman took me. We were in uh, Fort Lauderdale at a conference, and they had this fancy restaurant on this resort. It was called Ireland's. It was a steakhouse. And, um, I mean, this was pretty high, high level. And so they had a guy there just for our table. He stood there with a thing over his arm just for our table. When we ordered our steak, he came and said, which kind of knife would you like to cut your steak with? Five different knives. I saw a little cute one, you know. I said, I'll take that one. He said, that one's mainly for a rack of lamb. I would recommend this knife. Well, why did you ask me? Just hand me one. I mean, we only got one kind at home, and they never match. Why are you asking me this? 
And then he says, what kind of salt? They put down three different salts. And lavender salt, and lavender butters, and all. I mean, it was amazing. But I'm telling you what, if I just looked up, can I help you, sir? Not, can I help you? Can I help you, sir? Anything you need? And, um, and I'm telling you what, it was, one of the, it was one of the best food experiences I've ever had. Wasn't because it was the best food you ever ate. It's because the service was phenomenal. So when it says, when you said you've served the Lord, that means you've been active. No one has to go looking for you. Have you seen so-and-so? No, I haven't seen them. No, serving God is being active in him and with him. That doesn't mean just inside these four walls. That means you walk with God every day of your life. You're active with him in prayer. You're active with him in the word of God. You're doing something. You're teaching your children. You're doing something uh, in a way of being active and serving. And he says here, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials. Now, how many knows you don't have to be saved, being born again very long before opposition comes your way? But the Bible says when it comes your way to count it what? Joy. Count it all joy, which happened to me. Uh, by, it happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. 20, how I kept back nothing that was helpful but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews also, to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord Jesus Christ. And seeing now, out of all of that, he's getting ready to say, seeing now, that means all that I've done is done. Now we're going to keep doing. And seeing now, I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, Bound in the spirit. That doesn't mean that he's bound with his hands. That doesn't mean that somebody put handcuffs on him or tied him up. There was something in his spirit that had control of him. I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testify in every city, saying that change and tribulations await me. Now, how many knows when God tells you to do something, we get all excited. You know how many people uh, that has come to me and said, God sent me to a foreign field and uh, they call me. Matter of fact, I've had people call me because pastors tell some of the people in the church that are looking to get into missions, you call Ken Harbaugh. I've got more than one call by pastors telling their people to call me and get information. I had a guy called me one day, and he, uh, he asked for me. He started coming here a few times to the conference. I'd never met him. Matter of fact, while he was on the phone, I looked him up on Facebook just to remember what he looked like. And he says, uh, I'm so-and-so. I'm from, um, I actually was from Canada. And he says, uh, I'm looking to go into this country. And, and I talked to Pastor Barkley, and he says, uh, you need to call Ken Harbaugh. And so, because I've been there and whatever, so people get, so people call you about information. And I've never met anybody saying, God's sending me to this country, and all I know, that affliction and chains are waiting on me. They're always saying, God sent me there because it's going to change it, you know. There's going to be miracles and supernatural things that are happening. All kinds of things that's happening. You know, not one vision. I've never had a vision about Africa. I've taken many people. A lot of people have taken. I've never had a vision where I saw fires jumping up off the map of Africa. And I've seen all kinds of things and visions. You know, I, I, I never had that. All I had was an opportunity to go and I went and everything happened from that point. You know, so if you have that, thank God. But if you don't, it doesn't mean that nothing's going to happen when you still arrive. Because you're still following the peace of God that's going on. Amen. I've never heard anybody saying, you know, God sent me to go to this town to start a church. He's called me to go start a little church. He called me to pastor a small church. No, everybody feels called to uh, pastor a church. It's going to be big and it's going to be that. That is the concept. But Paul says here, I'm called to go to this place. I'm called. And he says, uh, all I know is when I get there... There's going to be change and tribulation waits on me. Now, that's not, a very good, uh, that's not a very good commission, is it? But look at verse 24. But he said, but none of these things, what? Move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself. So that I may finish my race with what? 
you know, he's getting ready to go into this area. He's getting ready to go into an area to where he knows tribulations and chains are awaiting him. But he says, none of these things move me. I'm going to go that I may finish my race with joy. Now, how many of you forget the concept of finishing my race with joy? How many of you are battling with joy within your race? You know, there's, it's miserable. I, I, I worked with guys in, when I was in the trade many years ago that hated to go to work. I worked, if I was strong, I worked when I felt bad. I, I worked when I was happy. I worked when I was sick. I had this concept, because I needed money. I had this concept, if I'm going to be sick, I might as well go to work and get paid to be sick. I have, I have went on the other side of this little raggedy truck that I carried materials and scaffolds in while I was bringing everything up that I didn't know I had left in me while they were loading the truck so I could go and work. If I, I said, if I'm going, to be, I'm going to be sick if I'm sitting at home or I'm going to be sick if I'm on the job. I didn't care. I went to work, man. I, I, I went to work. I went to work. But I had guys that were miserable. They hated work. They hated work. This one guy missed a day every day. He was raised up here on Shine Road. Every week. every week. He missed a day every week. Now, the only time he would, if you would work Saturday, he'd work because he'd get the time and a half. Because it wasn't 40 hours, then time and a half. You work Saturday, you got time and a half. Even if you only work three days during the week. That was a union deal. But he would miss a day every week. And I said, Tim. Why do, you, why do you only work four days a week? He said, because I can't get by on three. <laughs> he hated work, man, and was a good, good craftsman. But I, I watch people, you know, 30 years General Motors, dread every day going in. Every day, dread. Why do you go? Because I need money. There's no joy in it. But I watch people do that with God sometimes. I wish it wasn't Sunday already. I dread going to church. Pastor's going to preach the same thing he preached last week. He's just going to put a different title on it. <laughs> what would make you say that? Because I've heard that. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter what's going to happen. You know, it's, it's there. But Paul said, I'm going to go. God's sending me to a place, tribulation and trials awaiting. But I'm going to go. Look, look, look what he said here. He said, so that I may finish my race with joy. You can't finish your race with joy if you don't have joy in your race. And I'm not talking about your color race. I'm talking about the journey that you have in walking with God. No, you'll never finish your course with joy if you don't have joy in your course. You'll never finish. You know, you can't, there's no sense being a miserable Christian. Well, how do I stay out of it? Serve God. Amen. Joyfully. Joyfully. Hebrew says, and I quoted the scripture not long ago. It says, they took joyfully the spoiling of their goods. That means when the enemy came and robbed from them, they didn't say, thank God the devil stole from me. No, because the devil could not steal their joy. The devil could not maintain their goods. He had to give it back. That's when I said, if you recognize the thief that stole from you, he has to recompense seven times. That's why you never put your joy, attach it to people or things. Because if people or things are gone, your joy is gone. And no joy no strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And when I look at Paul saying, God is sending me here. I've done all of this stuff and now I'm getting ready to go here. And the only thing I know is not miracles. And, 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 you know, I'm going to preach the gospel signs and wonders going to be done. But the only thing I know really is tribulation and trials. Afflictions, one translation said, awaits me, but that I may finish my course with joy. Pastor, what are you saying? I'm saying, I believe the strength of your walk is going to be determined by the depth of your joy. 
I'm going to say that again. The strength of your walk will be determined by the depth of your joy. If the enemy can steal your joy, he'll continue to steal your joy. You know, how many people that said, you know, I'm not going to go to church anymore because, you know, they're just a bunch of hypocrites. But you'll go to work next to them. Not everybody you work with is righteous, holy. They'll, they'll lie about being sick when they're not. They'll lie about the car breaking down, being late when they really didn't break down. Come on. You don't have a problem working next to them. So as people get messed up, I don't want to go to church with people that, that are hypocrites. Well, just because they are doesn't mean I am. Every man's going to be judged according to his own work. Ain't no sense allowing your work to be judged according to another man's weakness. You just serve God. Knowing that God's going to deal with that person. Nobody's going to get by with it. God knows everything going on. He knows. He knows. He knows. There's a movie that my kid used to watch. I still like to watch it. It was called The Perfect Game. These Mexican baseballers. In the 1957 World Series. And their priest got sent back to Mexico. And all of a sudden they read about this thing. The coach made it up. You know, I got a letter from, from your padre. He says, now when you play La Mesa today. And they said, well, how does he know we're playing La Mesa? He said, he knows. He's the man of God, Estupido. <laughs> he knows. God knows what's going on. They're not going to get by with it. He knows. I gotta, when will God ever judge that person for all they're doing? He knows. Payday don't always come on Friday. It don't always come at the first of the month. But sin and rebellion will always come to a point where it's dealt with. It's just you got to let God be God. Come on. Your journey can be filled with joy. And your walk with God could be the greatest thing that you've ever experienced. If you quit looking at the circumstances and base your joy off of what you're going through. And knowing that it's your joy that's going to give you strength to beat that circumstance. If I don't have any strength, I can't do it. If I don't have any strength, so I'm going through, through this. It's the joy of God in me. It's the word of God in me that gives me the ability to beat that. And if the enemy's able to steal my joy, I'll never have a victorious walk. It will be a defeat. It will be a down and out thing most of my life. Now, we've all gone through this. We've all gone through it. Even myself, we've gone through it. Even myself. We've all, we, we all go through things. We all go through things. Angels asked me more than once, you still have joy in pastoring a church? How many times you asked me that? Many times. Why? Because she sees, you know, different things that happens. She asked me, she's asked me multiple times. Within the last week. <laughs> We're on vacation, having a good time. She said, you still having joy? She said, you still feel like you're doing the right thing? It ain't like she's trying to get me out. She just likes to hear it and believes I need to hear it also. Amen. I'm still in the right place, yeah. doing the right thing. Yeah. You still have joy in it? Yes. Do you still have joy in it? Well, you keep asking me. <laughs> but no. Let's read this verse. Look at verse 24 again. Look, let's do 23 and 24 together. He said, except the Holy Spirit testify in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me. Nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. You can't finish with joy if you don't run it with joy. I want you to get that in you. 
So when the tax comes this week, you got to realize I'm running with God. I'm running a race. And I can't allow the enemy to steal my joy just because he stole something that I like. I may finish my race with joy. And the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of all of all the grace of God. So now we see that there's a man that knows that he's getting ready to face something very difficult, but he's got the ability to face it because the enemy was never able to steal his joy when he went through the hardest times of his life. I, I know that emotions are, are real. We all have emotions. God didn't create us void of emotions, but the emotion is not what is supposed to govern your life. His words was supposed to govern your life. His words was supposed to govern your life. Well, I just don't love that person no more. Well, that's because you just got disappointed. You just got hurt. Your emotions got hurt. Your emotions got bruised. Your soul got bruised, but your spirit is still alive unto God. Your spirit is still alive unto God. You just got to allow the life inside of you to bring life to every other part in your body, your mind, your emotions, your will. It will do that if you learn to draw from the inside. Now, I've, I've told this story. I'm not going to preach a Ben Barton length today, even though I did say I like that. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <clears throat> there's no clocks in that building. That's not a hint to turn that off. Rob said he's going to turn that off one time. <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, there's times where as you go through a struggle, the key is you've got to go through it. Anytime you stop in the middle of it, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. Even when you're pushing somebody out of the snow in the wintertime around here, once, once, once you get them moving, what would you tell them? Don't what? Don't stop. Why? If you stop, you get stuck. You know, a lot of people stop in the middle of the race. And when they stop, they get... And then you got to have people push you to get you unstuck. I'm not going to ask how many people stuck. I'm not going to ask you how many people has got stuck. But, I've, but I have been stuck a time in my life. I've been stuck. And thank God that there's people that's helped push me to get me unstuck. But I don't want to spend my life always feeling like i got to be pushed. Come on. I don't want to spend my life where it's like I've always got to be pushed to be where I'm at. I don't want to be, I don't want to feel like somebody's always got to coerce me into serving God. No, you just decide this is the joy that I get in serving him. And I'm not going to allow anything or anyone to steal this joy out of my life. I'm, I'm not going to allow it. And if, if you get to the place to where you're not going to allow it to be stolen, then you get to the place where you can live in victory all the days of your life. Amen. So, so, uh, the final thing I was going to say, years ago, uh, there were several people. There was a person that came here to the conference that was in Africa, went to Africa many times. And, and during that particular year, uh, they've developed a relationship with Pastor Rothwell and said, uh, you know, uh, I'm not going to Africa this year. Well, I didn't go last year because of all the chaos, not because I was fearful something's going to happen to me. It's just that I can't be there and Scott and I be there and have all the meetings set up and then they put us under lockdown like they've been doing because of all the riding in the streets but this wasn't that way and he said I don't know I'm just not going to go and then uh, our sister from Camden uh, what was her name again Stroop, sister Stroop from Camden who went a couple times a year she said I'm not going to go this year because I just don't feel like I'm led to go well, that put pressure on me. This was years ago. This was, I'll tell you when it was. It was, it was in 95. This was, the, this was the 95 year. 
This was the 95 year where that uh, person went with me and said, sir, God, I remember what year it was because I remember I was in Tanzania and that's when they were going to try or plan on arresting me. You can't forget that. But, but everybody said they weren't going to go. And that put pressure on me. Like, well, you must be missing God because you are going. Because I'm just new at this. This is only my, this is only, this is only the third trip that I've ever taken. And so, uh, you just don't know what everybody else knows. So you probably ought to stay here. And people started putting pressure on me, questioning my ability to hear God. And I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. People started having dreams about me. I saw you walking down an alley, a dark alley. Somebody picked you up and took you and did harm to yourself, did, did harm to you. Number one, I'm not going to walk down a dark alley in Africa. I'm smarter than that. I'm not going to be by myself. I'm smarter than that. But all these, all these prophetic words started coming. And people started getting fearful. And I remember telling Dad, I said, I want you, I, I, there's something I need you to know. I feel in my heart that I'm to go to this country. I feel in my heart I'm going to go preach. If something happens to me while I'm there, please don't say I miss God. I know for a fact I'm to go. I have a peace in my heart about going. Now, I may miss God while I'm there. He may tell me to turn left and I turn right. I could do something stupid while I'm there by by not hearing God, not stupid doing sinful things. But I may do something there that could get me in trouble. But me going, I know it's right. I know it's the will of God to go. And I watch God do supernatural things that way. But I noticed... How people tried to steal my joy before I got there. But I did know that it's going to take the joy of God and the peace of God to operate while I'm there. So the enemy will do everything he can to mess with your joy. He will cause you to doubt yourself. He will cause you to question yourself. He'll cause you to question your gift. He'll cause you to question your ability. But all you've got to do is stand firm and say, I'm not going to lose out. I'm going to serve God. With joy in my heart. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Come on.